Good morning, everyone. My name is Louisa Slavkova, and this morning we're going to talk about a recent book of my organization, which is called Unrewarding Crossroads, the Black Sea Countries Amidst the European Union and Russia. And um, this is how it looks like. Um, you're happy to have a look at our website, which is sofiaplatform.org, and this is where you can find our publication. Now, how did the idea about this book emerge? Um, we, as part of a small management team of the whole publication, are part of a fellowship which is called Black Sea Young Reformers Fellowship, supported by two organizations. On the one hand, the Robert Bosch Foundation, and on the other hand, the Black Sea Trust of the um, German Marshall Fund. Um, we were fellows in 2013, and up until then, there was no single publication that is tackling the Black Sea countries from a foreign policy perspective. What does that mean? Um, there was no single publication that would look into the specifics of every country and what is it that decides upon the foreign policy agenda of these countries. Meaning, is it um, the former communist parties slash reformed socialist parties um, or is it something different? Is it their geopolitical um, position? Is it uh, their proximity to a big a power in the region? Or is it a specific resource that they are um, having at their disposal, like in the case with, um, with Azerbaijan, for example? Um, and um, what we did is we focused on looking for contributors from all those countries around the Black Sea, them being um, Bulgaria and Romania as part of already the European Union, Turkey, which is in, um, again, um, um, towards the EU in an accession um, negotiation phase for some time now. Then we have countries that are part of the European Eastern Neighborhood Policy and the Eastern Partnership, then being um, Armenia, Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, then we have Azerbaijan, and then of course we have um, also Russia. Um, we looked specifically for young researchers and we managed to stick to this uh, premise um, in most of the countries because we wanted to give a voice to those young analysts that are not um, so popular um, yet among the foreign policy community um, around the world. And we also looked, of course, for contributors from the network of the Black Sea Young Reformers Fellowship. Our editorial board um, consisted of a few of the members from the fellowship, Anna Hichirinyan, who was my uh, um, uh, partner in the project, and is a young foreign policy analyst from Armenia. Then we had um, Vesla Cherneva from the European Council on Foreign Relations, Yana Kobzova from the European Endowment for Democracy, and Hrant Kostanian from SEPS in Brussels. What we did as a result out of the work of around one year, um, which was also very turbulent in our region, um, were 12 papers, as I said, nine country profiles and three so-called cross-cutting topics. Um, um, there are a lot of things in common when it comes to the challenges of the countries in the region, but then again, there are not so many commonalities among them all nine. Um, so the three cross-cutting topics are um, one of them being energy, because we found out that most of the countries around the Black Sea have similar energy challenges to face. Um, the other topic um, is hard security, because it's, again, very high on the agenda of the Black Sea region um, since the, um, the annexation of Crimea and the ongoing war in the eastern part of Ukraine. Um, and the third cross-cutting um, topic is um, focusing on Europe's eastern policies, um, and um, it is in light of the ongoing review of the European neighborhood policy. So what has been our main assumption in the book? Um, there is the dichotomy between the European Union and Russia um, in the Black Sea region. And apparently there are a number of countries that are caught in between. Some of them are aligning with the European Union, some of them are aligning with Russia. And apart from few of them, none of the countries is really able to make a choice which is based on its genuine needs. 
their choices are um, rather having um, what we also call in the book a price tag of the consequences of a wrong choice. Um, and this is something we've seen through with frozen conflicts, invasions or gas, gas price increases. Um, and um, while the European Union is having a so-called enlargement fatigue, um, and it's, uh, this fatigue is grounded in solid arguments um, against an enlargement to the East, at least to this point, um, we have at the same time um, Russia that initiated um, a counter uh, integrational project, the Eurasian Economic Union, as a counterweight to the um, EU attempts. So the question remains open um, whether um, the Eurasian Union will become ever a genuine driver for regional integration and whether it will serve the other countries rather than um, itself. But nevertheless, these two projects um, clash in this um, more or less contested neighborhood and none of them is able to offer um, what the countries in this neighborhood call for. Um, this is partially also because these countries have a lot of homework to do. Um, um, but also, as I said, um, a part of um, partially because um, on the one hand, Russia's intentions are probably not as genuine as, um, as one would expect an integrational project to be. And on the other hand, because the European Union is not ready yet to commit um, to, um, to a deeper integration with the, the neighboring countries. Um, the book, in terms of structure, is organized in four chapters. One covers, as I said, this common neighborhood of the um, EU and Russia. Um, the second chapter covers or focuses mainly on the EU um, and Russia and what are their aspirations in the region. The third chapter covers um, Bulgaria and Romania as part of the European Union and tackles or also Turkey, um, again, for structural reasons, um, as um, one which is already having accession negotiations with, um, with the European Union. Um, and the fourth chapter is the so-called thematic chapter that covers um, topics like energy and hard security. Um, now, I'm gonna go through um, the content of the book a little bit to be able to give you a sense and I'm very sorry that this is, of course, not going to be um, that um, detailed as it would have been um, if you would have here instead of me, 12 contributors uh, sitting and talking to you. Um, I would start by saying that the Black Sea region, as any other region perhaps in the world, is a, um, is a question open to debate and is, a, as a region, um, uh, a product of a construct. Um, it, compared to other regions, though, has little or less things in common when it comes to all the Black Sea countries um, in terms of um, economy, in terms of, um, you know, political setup. And I'm saying this being aware that, of course, most, most of the countries, but not all, have their post-Soviet slash post-socialist um, um, uh, past, um, but when you look at when you think of other regions like even the BRICS or Western Balkans or um, Central Eastern Europe, there is more in common than when it comes to the Black Sea countries. Because first of all, they all vary in size. They vary in terms of their um, experience in the past. I mean, on the one hand, we have a country like Turkey, and on the other hand, we have a lot of post-Soviet countries. Um, so the, the construct um, Black Sea region um, is old, but it regained popularity in the early 90s after the collapse of the bipolarity of the world order. And when, of course, the regional powers started re-emerging from, uh, from the ashes. And of course, they also started seeing um, opportunities on the one hand, but also challenges. Um, very soon, and especially in the past um, one decade, um, the Black Sea region um, somehow realized that also the uh, external observers, I guess, that the challenges in the division lines are sometimes bigger than, um, than we can handle at once. Um, and the more assertive engagement on the one hand of Russia with the Black Sea region and on the other hand of the EU 
um, brought the countries willingly or not, um, I mean, brought the EU and Russia in a rivalry for the common neighborhood. Um, in, the, um, in the wake of the uh, big, big bank enlargement of 2004, um, in the experience that the European Union did with, um, uh, with countries uh, previously that would have needed more reforms in order to join the EU, um, the EU saw itself um, persuaded but also pressured to decide what to do um, with its neighbors um, to the east apart um, instead of <clears throat> I'm sorry instead of um, offering them the integration perspective. Um, and to this moment, you know that the European Union after 2007, after the referendum in France and the Netherlands, faced also a severe um, financial crisis. And next to the rise of nationalist and populist um, emotions in the EU countries, this made the European Union rethink its enlargement policy. Within the European neighborhood policy came up with the, with the setup of the Eastern Partnership. Um, <clears throat> which is, um, broadly speaking, a framework um, that supports the reforms and fosters political association, but also economic integration um, of the eastern neighbors within the EU. And these are um, mentioned Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine. Since um, 2009, I, um, um, there are always progress reports published by the European Commission, and the, the, the initiative has um, indeed significantly altered the foreign policy choices of these countries um, at certain moments even of countries like Belarus. Um, and over the last years, many of these countries have embarked upon the course of develop, developing a closer cooperation um, with the European Union, while others um, have decided to stay closer to Russia, be it um, on the one hand for economic, but also for um, for security reasons, um, as I mentioned. So not only um, the neighborhood of um, the EU and Russia has uh, started changing, but Russia has also um, started reinventing its role in the same neighborhood. Um, and its ambitions um, pushed it to follow its own a kind of Eurasian development um, development path. Um, and we saw the, the emergence of the Eurasian Economic Union, which is from normative perspective, very much following um, the rules and uh, um, the base on which the European Union is grounded. Um, it currently counts Armenia, Belarus, um, Kazakhstan, Russia, of course, and Kyrgyzstan to its um, to its member, mem members, um, and um, it's as a project, the Eurasian Union is in a, kind of an exclusive opposition to the European um, project. Um, Russia has always considered its neighborhood to be traditional and exclusive sphere of influence, um, and of course saw the EU initiative as an encroachment um, over its own interests. Um, from what we called um, <clears throat> around um, the war in Georgia, um, a sleeping bear, uh, um, Russia turned into a violent aggressor um, in order to counter EU's um, kind of soft power approach um, of um, integration of the eastern neighbors. And Russia adopted um, different tactics um, to kind of um, follow its divide and rule, um, uh, um, a bit by creating frozen conflicts in the region, um, or, or um, be them um, to have or to make an attempt of kind of Bosnization of a country like um, we see right now um, in Ukraine. So this is a term that I hear more often nowadays, um, analysts uh, speaking of. Um, so the so-called Russian world doctrine um, that is touching upon Russia, protecting the interests um, of its uh, of its um, um, Russian minorities in neighboring neighboring countries. Um, so following this doctrine, um, led Russia annex and invade a sovereign state, only to prevent it gravitate towards a Western sphere of um, sphere of influence. Um, so, looking at 
these two um so looking at the at the eu and russia uh, um, approach to the neighborhood we have of course the countries um the countries themselves part of the eastern partnership initiative um and it's a premise a common premise of small states um that they need to maintain a very well balanced relationship with um with the large power centers in their neighborhood and in this case this has been the um the attempt of all the small countries, basically of all the countries in the neighborhood. Um, so they've tried to keep this well-balanced relationship with the EU and Russia, um, because very often um, these are um, important, even vital partners when it comes to um, when it comes to their economy. Um, so as I mentioned in the beginning, instead of instead of you know grounding the cooperation. Um, between these countries and um, the EU or Russia on um, their on the specific needs of the countries, they very often um, their relations came with this price tag of the wrong um, of the wrong choice made, um, and in this attempt to balance um, the balance um, out has proven to be um, very often counterproductive, um, and the countries. Um, sooner or later found themselves at what we call an unrewarding crossroad. Um, so the countries are facing this very difficult dilemma, but also very costly for them, um, between what looks at least at this stage um, like two irreconcil um, irreconcilable projects, um, the European and the Russian one. Some even would call them not only two irreconcilable projects, but also um, <clears throat> different civilizational um, civilizational choices that these countries need to make when and if deciding whether to um, side with the EU and whether to with Russia. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> and very often, um, unfortunately. Um, the choice that the countries make um and if it turns out to be the wrong choice it comes as i said with a price tag beat um gas prices um uh, increase or product embargoes hard security threats so very often the choices <clears throat> that the countries make have implications also on whether the country would go forward um to further consolidation of democratic structures and institutions or would slide back um, in terms of its development. Um, and as a result of this back and forth, the result of the of the two um, two projects that are dragging countries in different um, very much opposed directions, only Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine signed um, an association agreement with the European Union by the summer of 2014. Um, Ukraine was somehow forced to abandon its European integration agenda in 2013 and return to it at a very high price of losing considerable part of its territory in a, um, you know, what um, analysts call a hybrid war to Russia. Um, Armenia is another case. It's having a very tricky geostrategic environment and basically um, two out of its four borders are sealed. Um, so it's having pressing security concerns we see nowadays Armenia in the headlines over <clears throat> popular protests over the electricity prices. Um, and of course, um, citizens are very careful not to speak about the protest um, with a different nature. So um, they're um, rushed out of um, their experience they've made in previous years with Russia. They rush in explaining that this is not, um, not a Maidan. So um, Armenia was pressured to abandon its integration course and made a very sudden for everyone U turn um, and joined the Eurasian Economic Union. In September, when or in fall, when the European Union um, re, um, relaunches its negotiations with Armenia, we will see um, a sui generis in the relationships between the European Union and the Eurasian Economic Union, because then we'll see how the um, how the interplay between the two of them is going to work um, based on uh, the cooperation uh, with Armenia. Um, 
out of these countries, I think um, only somehow Azerbaijan, um, because we also see Moldova, um, you know, um, going back and forth between a, uh, a pro-EU and a pro-Russia um, uh, stance on the, on the other hand. Uh, maybe only Azerbaijan has managed to keep a safe distance um, from both the EU and Russia, both being its I think first and second most important trade partners, um, but this has been by the virtue of its energy card. Um, um, and Azerbaijan is in in the um, in this in the current um, conflict between the EU and Russia is becoming more and more important because because of the energy security of the European Union and the recent um, energy union, Azerbaijan is part of the plans for the South Gas Corridor is, um, is becoming even more important. It's also very interesting to observe how here the relations are going to, um, to evolve. Um, so apart from the policy papers that we have published um, tackling these uh, countries that are part of the Eastern Partnership, we thought that it will be um, way too one-sided if we don't look at the other countries as well, being um, Romania, Bulgaria, but then also Turkey. In Bulgaria and Romania specifically because um, in economic and political terms, um, some um, 10 to 20 years ago uh, looked exactly the same way as um, nowadays um, some of the countries of the Eastern Partnership. Um, which, on the other hand, um, gives a lot of hope when it comes to um, when it comes to the, um, the the development processes in the Eastern Partnership countries. But then again, um, the geographical proximity of these countries to Russia um, is not the same as the one of the Eastern Partnership countries. And um, in the, a country like Bulgaria, for example, which had the attempt of becoming the 16th Republic of the Soviet Union in communist times, um, still um, was not a former Soviet Republic. And I think this is a very, um, very crucial moment. So we have, um, as I said, apart from the Eastern Partnership countries and um, country profiles, we have also a profile um, of Bulgaria and um, Romania. There, um, compared to the uh, other countries as part of this big, big bank um, um, enlargement of 2004, they joined the EU in 2007, but also under special conditions, the so-called um, CVM, so uh, a mechanism for cooperation verification, which means that regularly the commission is um, issuing reports uh, which are assessing the situation in Bulgaria based on um, a number of challenges that the country has to solve and face. This means that the country was the countries were not at the state at which they were supposed to be when they joined the European Union. Um, um, so the EU made a kind of concession um, um, back then in 2007. So what the countries have been doing in these years since 2007 is on the one hand learning how so-called how to play the brussels game so they learned their way through the brussels institutions and also how to upload their foreign policy agenda in this case um uh, their black sea neighborhood on to the um brussels uh, brussels level but on the other hand um and at least as it's in the case of bulgaria um this legacy of the former communist party is uh, still very strong so that whenever there is a government in the country that is rep by representatives of the socialist party which is uh, which inherited the communist party but also um, um, another party which calls itself liberal but is uh, represents the Bulgarian uh, um, the Turkish ethnic minority in Bulgaria um, there is always a um, leaning towards um, towards Russia and also leaning towards uh, Russia-led um, economic projects in the country. And whenever there is a um, center-right or a more conservative government, then there is a, a firm, um, firm pro-EU and pro-NATO um, orientation. Um, and I need to say here that it was not clear um, um, up until um, 
um, 15 years um, um, in the past that Bulgaria is going really to go into the direction of, um, of um, Euro-Atlantic integration. Um, so um, we can say that, as I said, I mean, Bulgaria, because Bulgaria is the country that is uh, most familiar to me, um, we had, I can say, a number of missed opportunities in this attempt to you know, kind of reinvent ourselves, research our own, our own identity, caught in between the legacies of the Soviet past and um, and the, the the West. On the other hand, um, and I can say that we've missed a number of opportunities to develop a proper strategic blueprint for um, relations with the Black Sea countries, and especially those in the Eastern Partnership, because a lot of the experience that we've gathered in the years of transition is um, very relevant to the Eastern Partnership countries. And as we all know, the neighborhood policy of the European Union depends heavily on um, the neighboring countries um, um, or the periphery of the EU that is neighboring the, the Eastern neighborhoods to take the lead and to initiate uh, projects, uh, joint projects with the countries. Um, so apart from Bulgaria, we have also Romania, which was also part of the Soviet bloc um, um, until 89. Um, and it has also kept a very a very low profile in the Eastern Partnership region, um, except the part, uh, of course, from its engagement um, with Moldova, um, because Romania has um, a number of other, I would call them rather perceived foreign policy challenges, um, because, um, having on the one hand neighboring Hungary, um, where there are growing concerns um, about the um, direction into which the country is going with its uh, new very conservative uh, leadership. Um, and on the other hand, Romania is, um, at least this is what I got from the country paper, somehow feeling abandoned uh, from the EU to deal on its own with this um, rather difficult neighborhood. And um, knowing that Bulgaria Bulgaria sometimes um, sides with uh, with the Russian. Um, I mean, as I said, according to the government, sides with the Russian uh, with the Russian stance. Um, there are also concerns um, in Romania about its um, its southern neighbor. Um, so further to the south, there is Turkey, um, which is uh, deserves, I guess, a lecture on its own. Um, but Turkey was, um, or is somehow, at least before the elections now on the 7th of June, it was somehow divided um, between, on the one hand, the stated need for a zero problem course with its neighbors um, in the not so favorable realities on the ground. And on the other hand, with the consuming neighborhood in the Middle East and North, North African region, um, where there are various threats for um, for Turkey, um, be them security, um, going over to terrorism, migration, but also the simmering um, Kurdish question. Um, at the same time, um, there is a steadily diminishing um, hope, but also not only hope for your membership, but also desire for your membership within um, the country. Um, so Turkey is having its own geostrategic ambitions in the broader Black Sea region, um, especially when it comes to the Turkic-speaking countries, and this is something that Turkey um, declared already in the beginning of the 90s. Um, so the EU-Russia dichotomy offers um, challenges to Turkey um, alike, but also a lot of opportunities. Um, Turkey is on the one hand a very important ally of, um, of the EU, but it's having also special partnership with Moscow. And this is manifested in a lot of cases. Recently we show that immediately after the, recently we show that Putin basically announced publicly um, the death of um, of South Stream in um, Turkey, where he announced um, that there is going to be instead a Turkish um, Turkish Stream project. Um, so, speaking of um, of energy projects, um, as I mentioned, one of the cross-cutting papers in the publication deals with the energy sector. 
this is a sector that is having a lot of potential to solve um, to solve problems, and I think it has potential to potentials to solve problems beyond um, energy, simply because um, it offers. Um, a venue where the countries would come together in a regional um, in a regional setup that solves problems similar to most of the countries. Um, of course, in order to embark um, or for the countries to embrace a regional approach to their energy sectors, this needs first of all trust and trust building measures, which is something very difficult in the current setup. Um, and on the other hand, it requires uh, and this is a vicious circle because investments are done only when where there is um, there is a um, not only economic but first and foremost political stability. Um, and um, I think that apart from I'm really convinced, and this is something that is also mirrored in the paper in the book, um, that the regional um, the regional energy policy cooperation is the key to solving a lot of the energy problems that the countries are having. Um, and part of this regional um, cooperation approach would be really to go beyond natural gas um, projects. Um, countries in the Black Sea region have naturally diverging and competing roles when it comes to energy because some of them are big consumers, some of them are transit states, and some of them are um, suppliers. Um, the recent EU project um, on this um, on this uh, um, kind of energy stage is the Energy Union, and in my view, it offers um, a very good venue for cooperation for these countries. Um, to kind of try to wrap it up or sum it up, um, the EU Russia rivalry. Um, altered the or alters the entire geostrategic and security setup of the region this is beyond any um question um so the countries um are currently reassessing and need to reassess their choices and options and um them most of them being small countries they are um kind of doomed to look for ways to um to balance well between um the big powers in the region um, the European Union is now reassessing its neighborhood policy and has started drafting recommendations. Um, one of them is going to be about its ge geographic um, uh, division. So the European Union is probably going to focus more on the one hand um, to the east and on the other hand to the south. So draft its policies um, according to the way um, these, um, these regions are um, 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 constructed. On the other hand, the European Union is now reassessing its so-called global um, foreign policy and security strategy. This is a strategy that was drafted in 2003, you remember back then, the Iraq war and the need for the EU to speak in one voice. But the global strategy of the EU is already outdated, so um, it is now looking at a world that is more contested and more uh, complex than it was uh, some 10 years ago. Um, and how it addresses these regions is also going to be part of um, part of its new um, setup. Um, so it remains um, to be seen how the reassessment of the EU, both of its neighborhood policy and of its global strategy, is going to um, to uh, to reshape the way the EU works with the, with the southern neighbors and how it not only supports the democratic forms in these countries, but also addresses other problems such as um, energy, hard security, um, and stability, but without further antagonizing the situation. Um, Russia, on the other hand, appears to be determined to keep, um, to keep its um, course of very assertive, I would call it rather aggressive neighborhood policy. Um, which is increasingly approved by its population, um, despite of sanctions, um, despite of shrinking economy, um, and in despite of downslides within the Eurasian Economic Union, um, and just on the part of its closest allies. Um, and I think the time ahead is especially difficult 
countries because they need to stick to a very tough reform process and me coming from a country that underwent um, the um, this um, this uh, process um, I can say that it's keeping sight of the long-term perspective is sometimes very very difficult and um, um, the geostrategic contention um, poses immediate economic and also security threats for them um, at this situation that looks both as a crisis and as a stalemate we very much hope that our publication will give a very fresh impetus to all the policymakers engaged in rethinking the new um, European order. Um, thank you very much for this uh, conversation today and I hope you enjoyed the lecture and also reading um, our publication.